I just spent the whole day today talking to people that were just freaked out about the coronavirus. And um, I think I need to you know, kind of set some straight, record straight and, and tell you that there's some good things coming down the pike. Uh, Maria Croyle, who is the uh, professor of um, pharmaceutics at the University of Texas, Austin, um, wrote a nice little article about what's in store for vaccines. And they were challenged by the National Institute of Health back with the Ebola thing 2007. They were challenged to come up with a vaccine that was dissolvable in your mouth. And so they looked into it and they spent the time and they developed it. It took uh, a year, 58 different trials, to figure out what to do. And, the, and they kind of got inspiration from Jurassic Park, you know, where they, they uh, preserved the dinosaur genetics in amber. So that's what they were looking at. And so they went through a number of substances and they were able to take these viruses and um, preserve them in little sheets of, they look like candy. Looks like uh, double the size of um, contact lens. And, and they, they, this, they were working on it, like I said, in 2007. So they had these experiment ones they were doing with the Ebola. And three years later, they test them and they're still viable. Those viruses are still viable. So we've got some great things coming down the pike as far as vaccinations are concerned. Um, and in the meantime, till that's developed, I just need to let you know how your immune system works. So your immune system is designed to preserve you and destroy what's not you. It's really simple. And so <clears throat> when a virus is present, like somebody sneezed or whatever, or it's on a doorknob or something, and you pick that virus up, it's going to get into an orifice, like your mouth or your nose or your eyes. Well, if it gets into your nose, you have this thin layer of mucus that traps that virus. And then one of your white blood cells, the macrophages, they can get out into that thin layer of mucus, grab that virus, and then present it to a T helper cell, which will then determine which T killer cells would be specific to destroy that particular virus. So your immune system is already activated just by breathing it in. Now, in that thin layer of mucus, all these viruses can get trapped. And when that's determined that those viruses are there, the thin layer of mucus will liquefy and run out your nose. That's the first way your immune system works. It runs it out your nose. So if you take an antihistamine and stop the running, then you're preserving that virus inside you, and then you're going to have more problems. Now, that thin layer of mucus is working in your mouth, in your throat, uh, into your lungs. And uh, when it's determined that there's something dangerous there, and after the macrophages have got their information, then that thin layer of mucus is expelled out through a cough. <laughs> so if you take a cough drop, you're basically keeping virus inside your system. So you want to stay away from cough drops, and you want to stay away from antihistamines. And then if it gets into your system, if it's really aggressive and gets into your system, then uh, it's not even alive. And so this genetic package will bump up to, into a cell, mechanically inject itself into the cell, and then use your RNA and DNA to replicate. And then one cell can produce a million viruses. That cell deteriorates, and those million viruses go out and get a million other cells, and each one of the millions, to see how dangerous a virus can be? It is only your immune system that can prevent that from happening. So you, your macrophages around that cell will detect the elimination. See, everything in the universe is alive. It has to be nourished. And every living thing in the universe has to eliminate. So with that elimination from that cell, the macrophage can pick up on the genetic material that's in that cell, realizing it's not us, takes that genetic material to a T helper cell. That T helper cell then determines which T killer cells would be able to destroy that virus. And then a T killer cell injects that into the cell and destroys the viruses that are in there. 
and keeps it from spreading. It is only your immune system that does that. That's why the medical profession is so up on vaccines, is because that alerts your immune system to a problem so it can get geared up, so when it happens, the immune system is ready. And so I'm one of the first people to advocate for giving a healthy person a little dose of a virus to get them prepared. If you give that little dose of a virus to someone whose immune system is compromised, then they can get the full-blown disease and die. So we're mainly talking to healthy people and people that aren't immune compromised and haven't been kept alive for years on drugs. They depend on them for their existence. And so with, they figure that's maybe 90% of us. 80% will never have to see a doctor with this virus. But even 20% can overwhelm the whole medical system. And that's what's so dangerous about it. But if we all take care of our own immune system and we're ready for it, then we're going to save the country, save the planet, save everybody from this, this virus. And so it doesn't matter which virus it is. It doesn't matter if it's Ebola. It doesn't matter if it's a, um, Zika. It doesn't matter if it's um, MERS, SARS, or the pig one, you know, or this one. It doesn't matter where it came from or if somebody created it or if it came from Mars. I don't care. It's different than what's in your body and it will be attacked and dealt with with your own immune system. So I'm not that concerned with viruses. I'm concerned with people being healthy and ready to take care of the situation. And so we know what things work and what things don't. If you're stacking ramen in your cupboards and that's what you're going to eat, you most likely are not going to have the vitamins and minerals necessary to fight off this disease because what makes your body healthy also makes your immune system healthy. And so as far as um, the foods, of course, fresh fruits and vegetables is your best bet and is going to have most of your nutrients, your vitamins and minerals that are needed. Um, Captain Crunch and uh, um, Lucky Charms and uh, Twinkies and Coca-Cola is not your way of building a strong immune system. However, it is interesting as far as um, stimulating your immune system is concerned. The one food that we know that stimulates your immune system is mushrooms. It doesn't even matter which mushrooms. Even your common mushrooms you eat every day, they're not a food. I mean, they're not a vegetable or a plant. They're not an animal. They're a fungus, and the body fights funguses. But when it starts up on the mushrooms, and then, and then your immune system realizes this isn't a threat, so it's okay. But th those foods, mushrooms, can stimulate your immune system. But there's other things that can stimulate your immune system, and one of them would be like echinacea. And that's been proven time and time again, that it basically stimulates the, um, specifically the macrophages to increase in number and motility. So they're up and ready and active, ready for anything that comes in. And that's what's the value of echinacea. The um, worst foods for this particular virus would be something that would congest the lungs. And uh, the main thing that congests lungs and is a killer for someone with asthma would be milk and milk products. But that milk can really inflame the lungs. And, um, and uh, the body will use the inflammation to get rid of something it doesn't want. And dairy has exactly that in it. So that inflames the lungs. And then you get a virus that seems to affect the lungs first. And you see the problem? You're compounding it. So we want to stay away from dairy products. We want to stay away from sugar, white flour, um, highly processed grains. All those things are going to be damaging for the immune system. Now, there have been a number of studies out there, and uh, the Israelis did one that was really interesting. They studied elderberry. They didn't study a component of elderberry. They studied elderberry. And they found that when people are doing elderberry, consuming it, then that gets them ready for a fight with the virus. And so to keep a virus from taking hold and causing you to be really sick, we would do elderberry. And the Israeli study showed that. And of course, like I said, the echinacea. And so I thought it was really interesting that people would say 
something really stupid, that the immune system causes the damage from a viral infection. It's like, duh, how could that be? And so they're saying stay away from elderberry and echinacea because it stimulates your immune system into superactivity and then you get this um, over-inflammation of the system. And uh, that isn't the case at all. What's happening is that you're suppressing your immune system with anti-inflammatory drugs, maybe for arthritis or whatever you're taking them for. You're, you're suppressing your immune system from activity. Because when you have a problem, the immune system kicks in. That's how it works. Well, if you suppress it, the body's not dumb. It's like, I sent the signal for this inflammatory process. And so it sends a bigger signal. And you put a bigger block. And it sends a bigger signal. And you put a bigger block. And now you've suppressed your immune system from working. And then something like, this virus that's never been seen in a human body before triggers the immune system in activity and it overrides all the blocks and it becomes extremely inflammatory because you've put blocks on it and you've created a bigger signal that wasn't there before. So now you've got this storm and that's not caused from elderberry or it's not caused from good food. It's not caused from Echinacea, what it's caused from is your body being subjected to something it's never seen before and it freaks out. So don't worry about taking mushrooms and, and foods that help your immune system because that's exactly what's going to solve the problem. I kind of make it like a boxer, you know? If you're sparring all the time, you know, then you're going to be a little better equipped to fight the champion of the world, Rocky Balboa, you know, or one of the other ones, you know. And if you never have a fight, then how are you going to face the champion of the world? So here we've got the champion of the world, and nobody's had a chance to fight it. They haven't fought chicken pox, they haven't fought measles, they haven't fought anything. They haven't been subject to the actual virus. Now your immune system hasn't fought something and now it gets this coronavirus. And what do you think is gonna happen with a real weak immune system? Well, we're finding with this particular one that it's not doing a lot. Most people that get the virus don't know they have the virus. That's why it's spreading so fast. They get mild symptoms. Their nose runs. And what's running out of their nose? The virus. The body's working. You don't want to stop the body from doing what it's supposed to do. And so um, we need to fight. We need to have our immune system exposed to things that we can fight for. And, and I, I believe in giving a little bit of the boxer, you know, if you would, to the body's healthy system. You don't want to do it when they're sick. You don't want to do it when they're down. You don't want to do it when they're malnourished. That's why you're seeing all these deaths in these uh, third world countries from something that's not killing Americans because they don't have the nutrients. What you want to give them is nutrients. You want to nourish people so they can fight the fight. They can fight the champion of the world. Now, if the thin layer of mucus you know, doesn't take care of all the viruses, some of them get in, which they will, then... Um, your body is going to use a chemical signal from the macrophages to the T helper cells and then also to the T killer cells, this interleukin-1. And that interleukin-1 starts the fever process. So that's where you get a fever. It's from your own immune system. Your immune system says, I need this heat situation. I need this environment to not only suppress the invader, but also to stimulate its own immune system. So if you take a aspirin or a Tylenol or ibuprofen or whatever you take to stop a fever, you just basically block that interleukin-1 message. So yes, you stop the fever and it does it very efficiently if that's what you really want to do. But then it also stops your immune system from propagating and from getting where it needs to be. 
So that's why we don't ever use something to stop a fever. We know that fever is what the body uses to fight the invader. So, what we do as vitalists, and that's what I call myself as a vitalist, I'm a master herbalist, but I also believe in vitalism, who was the first person to promote it was Hippocrates, the father of medicine. He distinguished vitalists from atomists. Vitalists were people that thought, well, the body is vitalistic in its approach to life, and it will do what's necessary to continue its life. So it's a vitalistic system that uh, whatever it's doing, we look at that and say, how do we help the body do what it's doing? Whereas the atomists are like, oh, that's like religion. You know, it's like God. You, know, you can't see it. You can't prove it. It doesn't exist. What exists is matter. We can treat matter with other matter and get our purposes. And what we say is that the body's now malfunctioning and we're going to get it to function right. But the vitalists are saying, no, that's what the body needs to do. That's what we want to help it with. So when we cough, <clears throat> we don't take a cough suppressant. We actually take something like an expectorant to help expel it out. We, we don't stop the nose from running. We, we encourage it to run by breathing in essential oils. We help the body do what it's supposed to do. So when it has a fever, we want to help it with the fever. And I, I don't know why everyone's got this uh, pyromania out there, this, this fear of fevers. That's how the body works. And uh, maybe they think you're going to get your burn bur brain burned out, you know, with uh, having a fever. But it's not the case. The fever is what the body uses. And the only danger from a fever is if you're dehydrated. Because that's how the body controls temperature. You perspire, and it changes the temperature in the body. So the body's going to control the temperature it wants by having that fever. So the main thing to remember is hydration. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Drink way more than you would normally drink. You need to be well, well hydrated to deal with a fever. Now we as, as vitalists, we look at that and we go, oh, the body wants to be warm. We'll help it be warm. So we actually put you in a tub of hot water. And it's like, that's totally opposite what everybody else is thinking. I mean, you get some of these naturopaths that go, well, the temperature is this, and so we'll make the water that, and then we just lower the temperature of the water to bring down that fever you're still bringing down a fever. Or we'll have an herbalist say, oh, we'll just give you some white willow to bring down the fever. It's like, no, you want the fever. You want something like yarrow that's going to cause you to perspire and help you control the temperature. So we'll put them in a tub of hot water, and we'll have them drink like a quart of hot yarrow tea and be in that tub for an hour. And uh, there's no dangers unless you chill. Now, how are you going to chill in a hot bath? Well, you're not, but when you get out of the bath, then your body's going to change temperature real fast and chill, and that can be a little damaging in and of itself. So what we do is we say, well, the body doesn't want to be cold, so what we're going to do is we're going to use ice-cold shower. So we do a cold shower, close the pores, it keeps the heat process going, put them into bed, and let them keep perspiring and let the body control the temperature. And that's why we don't have any fear of fevers. We know how they work. Dr. Mendelssohn, a famous uh, pediatrician from the Chicago area, uh, head of the uh, Illinois um, Medical Association, in his book, How to Raise a Healthy Child in Spite of Your Doctor, he says that a fever will never go over 107 due to a bacterial viral infection, as long as you keep the body hydrated. So let's do that. Keep the body hydrated, get through this, and the thing is, is if you go through a viral infection and, and use the body's abilities, to, to get rid of the virus and to heal, then your T killer cells uh, will again do its job and then the body has what's called T um, suppressor cells or T memory cells. So that'll kind of bring everything back into the way it's supposed to be after the virus is taken care of. And the T helper cells will remember this particular invader for the rest of your life. Sometimes the T killer cells uh, get overwhelmed with the spread of a virus. And so um, then the next part of your immune system, the B cells, they're like little factories creating these uh, little Y-shaped uh, proteins 
that then attach to, they're, they're smaller, so they attach to along these viruses and target them for destruction. So the B cells kick in, but there's no memory in the B cells. The only memory in your immune system comes from the T cells. So you have your T memory cells, and you'll remember that the rest of your life. Now, if you inject that virus past your macrophages, past all the defense mechanisms, and get right into your bloodstream, then that can trigger B cells to be produced. B cells then have no memory. So you can fight off the disease with those B cells, but not have any memory. That's why vaccines don't give you immunization for life. Dealing with the disease itself gives you immunization for life. But if you put it in your mouth and it gets into the mucosa, then all the systems, the immune system work. So what we're saying is, yeah, we do need an immunization that just captures the viruses, maybe weakens them, but they don't need any adjuvants and they don't need any preservatives because they're preserved in this thin layer, looks like a candy, you know. And then released, then you don't have all the problems of the polysorbate and all the other things that they put into the vaccines. So that's why I said, there's hope. If they're going to do it right, and then you're going to be immune for life, and you get one of these viruses once, and then you'll never see, the, see it again. Your body's going to be ready for it, because it'll have those T memory cells in your body for the rest of your life. So that's what I want to do, is I want to give a little hope here that it's going to get better, and you personally can make it better, make it less dangerous, by eating the right foods and having a good, strong immune system. And I think that's my message today.